Once again, you've joined the online worship service of Fairfield Presbyterian Church. We welcome you. All that you need for participating in the service, you'll find on the home page, the order of service, the confession of faith, and the text of uh, the sermon. So we invite you to, to take advantage of those tools for worship. Uh, a few announcements. Note that Good Friday service will be here at the sanctuary of the Fairfield Presbyterian Church. This is the Good Friday service of the Bay Shore Cluster of Churches. Uh, note as well, next week, uh, March 14th, uh, on Sunday the 14th, there is the time change. You spring ahead, remember that? Fall back, spring ahead. So we lose an hour of sleep, so go to bed an hour earlier and uh, make sure to change your clock. Uh, this Saturday, the 13th of March, will be the study group. We, we ca call it the Broken Down House. That was the initial study that we partook of, but now the study here is the Portrait of a Struggle. Uh, Paul Tripp is the teacher, and it's excellent, excellent. It's the struggle of faith. And so we invite you to be a part of that 6 p.m. here in the Fairfield Church Sanctuary. So with all these in mind, let's prepare our hearts for worship. In the bulletin, you'll see a prayer of preparation. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Help us, Lord, to put your words into practice. Amen. And our gracious God calls us to worship. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And now, dear friends, you'll find on the home page embedded therein, our opening hymn for this morning, For the Beauty of the Earth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you with thanksgiving and praise. We rejoice, O oh Lord, that you are the God who has given us so much. Uh, Lord, all your benefits, the spiritual blessings that we have are numerous. And so we're, we are grateful. You've lavished on us every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ, the apostle says. Lord, you have given to us uh, a savior, even your eternal son, the Lord Jesus, who humbled himself, who came into this world and took to himself a true humanity, taking the form of a servant. He went to the cross, obedient unto death. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for his faithful, gracious sacrifice, his laying down his life. We thank you, Father, because he was the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. He was able to take his life up again for our sakes. We rejoice again as well for the Holy Spirit, the gift, the gift that he has given to us, whereby we are able to believe, understand, and, and truly live the gospel life. We pray, Father, that you would give us grace now to worship in spirit and in truth, with thanksgiving and with joy overflowing. These things we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Once again, our confession of sin comes from the excellent book Prone to Wander by uh, Barbara Duguid and Wayne Hauck. Uh, it is on unity. So let us pray. Triune God, you are one God in three persons, a diverse unity in whom there is neither division nor contention. You call us to be one body made up of many different members with different gifts and abilities as well as different needs and failings. We confess that we often take pride in our own gifts and look down on those who lack them while thinking little about our need for the gift of others in the body. We form factions and cliques to promote and support our own interests, desperately trying to attract the favor of those whom we think strong while despising and shunning those who we see as weak, unattractive, or broken. Father, forgive us. Jesus, thank you for your willingness to allow your physical body 
to be shattered and broken, to establish the unity of your spiritual body, the church. Thank you that in you we have unity that transcends all earthly boundaries. In you there is neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, slave nor free. Thank you for the particular love and care that you bestowed on the weakest and most ignored members of your community, especially women, children, and outcasts. By your gracious attention, you gave honor to those who lacked it. As the only mediator between us and the Father, you unite all your people in yourself. Holy Spirit, you are the one who gives each one of us our various gifts and callings. Help us to see and appreciate your work and other Christians, honoring them more highly than ourselves. Remove our stony, self-centered hearts and give us hearts of flesh that love our brothers and sisters in Christ and value them just as they are. Teach us to love them with all their weaknesses and sins as beloved children of our own Heavenly Father and servants of the same Master. Bind us firmly together into one new people, united by Christ's work on the cross and your continuing work in each of our hearts. Amen. We had a meeting with the British and Christian Ministers Association, and uh, when the mayor is able to attend, he'll give us the report of what's going on in the uh, city of Bridgeton and the area. He was very grateful. The uh, work has resumed on the uh, Wawa, the construction of a Wawa there in Bridgeton. Uh, Mayor Kelly has done a lot to encourage the city, the city he calls the great city of Bridgeton. So we're going to pray for him, this local leader and politician this day. Uh, let's, let's go to our Heavenly Father. Gracious Lord, we are thankful that you are the sovereign God who rules over all things. Lord, this reflects your wisdom, it reflects your power, your sovereign hand over all things, O oh Lord. And we thank you, Father, for we don't understand, we can't grasp or wrap our minds around such power. And yet, this is for you, you are God, and so we thank you. For these things. We thank you for these truths. Help us to believe them and understand them. Help us to know that even the difficulties that you ordain for us, Lord, they, they ultimately will work for our good. For all things, you, your word says, works together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So, Father, we pray for the end of this pandemic. We pray, Father, again, that the vaccine would be uh, equitably, fairly, freely uh, distributed, and, and Lord, uh, efficiently. And we pray, Father, that once again, we're able to meet in the sanctuary. Thank you, Lord, that we have now uh, a new limit. We can have a hundred in our sanctuary, and we thank you for that. We pray your blessing upon the church as we once again gather together to worship in spirit and in truth. Heavenly Father, we lift up uh, your people throughout the world, especially struggling in various countries, uh, persecution. Father, uh, received word this week that the nation of India is suffering greatly. The vaccines are not there yet. Uh, there are people who are struggling with COVID. Uh, the disease is spreading. And so we pray for that nation, O oh Lord, have mercy on them. And especially, Father, uh, true believers in Christ in that nation. We pray that they would be protected. Father, bring to that nation relief. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the, the gospel translations. We pray for uh, those people who are work, working to translate the Bible into the language of the people, that there may be the gospel proclaimed uh, in a language that they are familiar with. Lord, we just pray your blessing upon Wycliffe Bible translators and all those people working to provide uh, those translations, O oh Lord. We thank you, Father, for our nation. We do pray for our president, for our uh, congressmen and women. We pray, Father, that they would be wise in their uh, exercise of authority. And we pray, Father, that there would truly be a uniting of this nation. And Lord, for those laws which are unjust and and father foster inequality we pray that they would uh, not be passed 
We pray, Father, for grace uh, to this nation that we would continue with the freedoms that we have enjoyed. And Father, we, we pray, we pray for politicians, corporations, businesses, and people that they will wise up, O oh Lord, and see the foolishness of cancel culture, the real evil that is there behind it, O oh Lord, that we would see uh, the destruction of someone, the loss of their job, the loss of their good name, uh, because we don't like something they've said or done. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be a people who are gracious and who are loving, even as we confessed the sin uh, of disunity and uh, all that we struggle with, Lord. We, we frown upon those who we deem weak and foolish and ignorant uh, while believing that we are strong and wise and beautiful. Lord, forgive us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless our local uh, politicians with wisdom. We thank you, Father, for Mayor Albert Kelly and his love for the great city of Bridgeton. We pray, Father, with thanksgiving for the businesses that have been brought to our community. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to give uh, Mayor Kelly uh, that desire to honor Christ. Lord, he is at times attacked for his faith in Jesus Christ. And so we pray that you would protect him. And uh, Lord, we thank you again for his service. Lord, we do pray for uh, successful services, Good Friday services, Sunday morning Easter sunrise services. We trust you, Lord, that you would provide for us that which we need. Lord, we lift our hearts to you with thanksgiving. We lift all these petitions to you, uh, knowing that you will answer them in accordance with your perfect will. So bless, O oh Lord, these things through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In our text this morning, and the passage is found in Luke chapter 10, we'll begin at verse 25. But in this passage this morning, there are two essential components. While most Bibles will entitle this passage of Scripture, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, it should be noted that the parable was prompted by a question put to Jesus by a lawyer. One commentator says another appropriate title for this passage would be the contest between the lawyer and the teacher. And so this morning we'll deal with both of these topics and the lesson the great teacher has given to us, even our Lord Jesus. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the lessons that we will learn herein. We pray that we would take them to heart. I pray that I would make them clear. We pray, Father, that we would see ourselves in the struggle with this lawyer, the lawyer's struggle to understand his own sin. Lord, And may we see our sin and may we learn to confess our sin and acknowledge it, even as we cry out for mercy. So we ask today, Father, for insight and wisdom and, and grace to see, understand, and believe uh, these lessons that Jesus gives us. And Father, we pray these in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Luke chapter 10, at verse 25, we pick it up. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. 
Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Beloved, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. The longest recorded sermon of Jesus is the series of lessons that we know as the Sermon on the Mount. They are recorded in Matthew's Gospel from chapters 5 through 7. At the end of chapter 7, we read in Matthew 7, verse 28, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Jesus is the great master teacher who spoke with authority, not like the teachers of that day, the scribes, uh, because they were the copyists of the scripture. They would copy the scrolls of the word of God. And because they did that, they were familiar with the word of God. And so likely they were teachers in their community. Uh, but Jesus' authority was essential to his being, the eternal son of God, the promised Christ, by whose spirit the scriptures were inspired. But from a human perspective, Jesus had no official credentials, no study under a recognized authoritative teacher or rabbi. And so therefore, he had no acknowledged authority from the Jewish leaders. Now, Jesus has just met with 72 disciples who have come back from a successful mission and Jesus has expressed praise to God in which he thanked God for hiding these things. That is the gospel message from the wise and learned, so they thought themselves, and, and that God revealed them to babes, meaning to people who would receive his teaching like a child, implicitly trusting. And so uh, this lawyer he is one who is representing a system that Jesus was condemning. Jesus was taking a shot against the system of Judaism in his day, which nullified the law of God, and it was devoid of grace, mercy, and compassion. The religious system espoused by the Jewish leaders in Jesus' day had denigrated to a judgmental, legalistic self-righteousness. And again, uh, upon this scene comes this man who is representative of this system of religion. And in dealing with the lawyer's inquiry, who is my neighbor, Jesus gives what is perhaps the most well-known, one of the most well-known stories in the Bible, the Good Samaritan. I imagine there are a lot of people who have heard of that phrase, the Good Samaritan, and even they're not sure where it comes from. They don't realize it comes from the Gospels. And so the Good Samaritan, or as one commentator puts it, the Samaritan who cared. We understand that true saving faith is a gift of God. We are not saved by our works. However, our faith will be proved genuine by our works. And my neighbor is anyone who comes across my path and is in need of help or assistance, any help or assistance which I can render. So what person or persons, family members, or actual neighbors has the Lord brought into your life who is now a neighbor in need? Will you go and do likewise like the Samaritan and show compassion? Let's first consider the lawyer's challenge. Verse 25, and behold, the lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, when we, when we think of the lawyer in our day, in our context, we imagine a courtroom scene where an advocate defends a person accused of a crime. But the lawyer here is not that kind of lawyer. Instead, this man is an expert in the law of Moses. He is a professional in the application of the Torah, likely to help settle disputes between the elders and cases brought to them by the people. Uh, much of the time of this man would have been spent debating the law with other experts of the law, arguing and splitting hairs. Uh, th this professional seems to have a disdain for Jesus. 
the untrained rabbi. And that's the contrast. He is a highly trained specialist and expert in the law. Jesus has not had training. He, he doesn't have a recognized authority by the officials. And so this professional is going to put Jesus in his place. He wants to embarrass and test the Lord and embarrass him in front of the crowd who is, is giving him adulation. And so this lawyer asks about inheriting eternal life. How do I inherit? How do I gain eternal life? And what a glorious subject. Eternal life is not just living forever. It is of endless duration in a priceless quality of inexpressible joy and glory in the presence of the true and the living God. When Jesus offers his high priestly prayer in John 17, he defines eternal life as knowing the true God and Jesus Christ whom God has sent. Commentator William Hendrickson offers this observation. It is not suggested that this law expert was fully aware of the significance of the term he used. In other words, he didn't understand fully what eternal life meant. But it must be admitted that he was making inquiries about a most important matter. On the other hand, does not the very fact that everlasting life is such a glorious commodity make wrongly motivated questions about it all the more reprehensible? And so this man, in seeking to trip Jesus up with a question of how does he gain eternal life, uh, is really, he's not sincere in his questions. And you know, dear friends, there are a lot of people who have questions about biblical Christianity, but they're not sincere in their questions. The person that comes to me as a pastor, they come with a sincere question about Christianity, the Bible, why do Christians do what they do? I am glad and happy to answer some questions like this, but there are those questions put by people who just want to shut down any discussion of the faith. So this man's question is not really sincere. But Jesus then, he answers him with a question of his own. He says to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? The implication is that if this man is really an expert in the law of God, he should know the answer. He should know how one would gain or inherit eternal life. Uh, the answer he gives is, in fact, a summary of the Ten Commandments, uh, a summary that Jesus has given on occasion. And what was the man's answer? What, Jesus says, how do you read the law? The man says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Now, this is a combination of two verses, this, this summary of the Ten Commandments. The first part is from the Shema in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. The second half of this verse that the man quotes is in Leviticus 19, verse 18, where uh, Moses tells the people, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And Jesus acknowledges that the lawyer has answered correctly. And he says to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you shall live. Now let's unpack this summary statement. We acknowledge two points of focus with respect to the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments deal with how we are to love God. They show us how to love God. And so you are to worship no other gods. Don't make images of this God to worship them or bow down to them. Don't misuse his name and honor the Sabbath. That is, worship him on the Sabbath day. That's the first table of the law, dealing with our relationship to the true and the living God. And if we would love the Lord our God with our heart, with our soul, with our strength, with our mind, uh, and get that, with all your strength, all your mind, all your heart, all your soul, uh, if we would do these things from the heart, uh, that's the first table of the law. The second focus and the second six laws deal with our relationship to other people. And they express how we are to love them. 
So we honor father and mother. That's the first authority God gives us in our lives. We are not to commit adultery. That is, violate you know, the marriage relationship of another person. Uh, do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. And, and don't even think about it. Don't even covet or desire something of your neighbors, your neighbor's spouse or your neighbor's possessions. And so here's a correlation here. Love God, and if you're truly loving God, it will be expressed in true love for our neighbors. And so the essence of true religion is just that, love for God that overflows into sincere love for our neighbor. Again, note the fourfold with all. Love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Our love for God is to be accomplished uh, by every molecule, every fiber of our being. Now, it may appear that Jesus is teaching a salvation by works here. You know, is that what the Bible teaches? Many people think that, that I need to earn my way into heaven and eternal life. Well, the truth is, no one can ever do this. No one can ever completely obey from the heart, with his words, with his actions, the full law of God. And so if the lawyer fully understood the implication of Jesus' answers, do this, you know, follow this command, the summary of the law, do this and you will live. If he understood the implication of this, he should have fallen down and fell before Jesus crying out for mercy because he would have been convicted of his sin. And so let's consider the lawyer's sin. This is the crux, the very crux of the issue with this expert of the law. The lawyer's sin, verse 29. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Uh, this man believed that he could earn his way to heaven. And uh, I imagine he, like others who believed that they obeyed the law, he wanted to justify himself before our Lord. And, you know, that's something common to mankind. Uh, when we are caught in sin or, uh, you know, when we think we're all that, we, we are seeking to justify ourselves. Uh, if we're caught doing something wrong, we have a reason for why we did it, and that should excuse us. Well, this man really, uh, he believed earnestly that he could work his way, earn his way to heaven. He had no clue that he was in need of God's mercy. And this reveals that this so-called expert of the law really didn't understand God's law. God's law, first of all, is God's holy and righteous standard. It is the standard by which believers are to live by. And it is a standard which no one can live by. So when we fully understand the full intent of the law, the law then becomes our teacher. It tells us and teaches us that we do not have the righteousness that we need to earn heaven. And so it teaches us to flee to God for mercy. And in our case, flee to Christ for mercy and forgiveness of our sins. Uh, Dr. Sproul, R.C. Sproul, in his commentary, he writes about this. He says, we are unable to understand the mercy of God until we understand the law of God and how the law of God reveal, reveals to us our sin and our hopeless inability to justify ourselves. The law drives us to Christ who alone can justify sinners who are unjust. The lawyer who challenged Jesus made the worst possible mistake he could make. He thought he could justify himself. Probably most people think the same, that they can say to God, I led a good life. And dear friends, I've heard that many times when I've asked them, uh, if you were to die today and Jesus were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? Many times people have said to me, because I'm really not that bad, or I've led a good life. I, I tried to be the best Christian that I could be. But the truth is, none of us has ever perfectly fulfilled the righteous demands of God's law. 
And so, as Paul says, there's none, none righteous, none at one, none who understands, none who seeks God, no one who does good. No one has perfectly led uh, a perfect life, keeping the law. Uh, the Apostle James, the half-brother of Jesus, in his letter to the church, he uh, speaks against showing partiality, that is, favoring one group of people over another. In James chapter 2, he says, if you will really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become accountable for it all. So even if you fail at one point of the law, in your thoughts, you've failed the whole law. For he who says, uh, back to James 2, verse 11, he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who ha has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so when this lawyer should have seen that he could not live the life that the law commands of us, and so he should have sought the Lord for mercy and the forgiveness of his sins. So now Jesus, he is going to teach this lawyer just who is his neighbor. And this master storyteller, this master teacher, Jesus, who spoke with authority like none other. He, he gives the story of a man who heads down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, 21 miles, that's a trip. The man is stopped by highwaymen, murderous thieves who strip him, who beat him within an inch of his life. They take from him all that he has and they leave him for dead by the road. Now a priest passes him by, uh, going on the opposite side of the road, leaves him, offering no help. A Levite comes across the man and goes to the other side as well and hurries along past the injured man. And I've heard that people say, well, maybe the priest and the Levite, they were pretty much the professional clergy of the day, the priest offering the sacrifices in the temple, the, the Levites caring for the buildings in the temple and other tasks that didn't rise to the level of the job for a priest. And so these were the professional clergy of the time. But they, and so people will say, well, they had to keep their appointments at the temple. They had duty to serve. Uh, and so they did not w wish to be late. Well, just remember this, Jesus is giving a story and he doesn't give the motives of these men, just that they leave him unattended, unassisted, half dead by the side of the road. And there is no possible excuse for doing that. Now, I think it is also significant that Jesus identifies the first two men as a priest and a Levite. Do you realize that what Jesus is doing here is taking another shot uh, of the, against the religious system of the Judaism of his day? You know, and, and to add insult to injury, the man who does stop and assist this man that's left by the road is a Samaritan, the despised half-breed remnant of the pagan northern kingdom of Israel. And so it's this man who is despised, hated by the Jews, he stops. He stops and he renders compassionate care and aid. Notice the extent of the care that this man gives. Jesus tells us the Samaritan had compassion on this injured man. Uh, should not the priest and the Levite, who know something of the word of God, did, did they not know or remember the compassion that God had lavished on the people of God, even the Jews? And should they not have exercised the same compassion on this fellow human being? This man, we read in verse 34, this Samaritan, he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. They were healing and soothing agents. 
He then set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. My friends, that is generosity, and that is, that is love in action. It is compassion. And speaking about compassion, again, I turn to Dr. R.C. Sproul in his commentary. Sproul writes, we tend to cheapen this concept in our culture today. We say, I feel your pain, and we walk on by the other side of the street. Of course, true compassion goes far beyond mere feelings. If a person has real compassion, he doesn't just feel it, he shows it. In Psalm 103, verse 13, we read, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. What father would leave his son half dead in the ditch because he had an appointment uh, set to be somewhere else? God's compassion for his children, uh, in that compassion, it took Jesus to the cross. God didn't just feel bad for us. Jesus didn't just take care of us. He demonstrated compassion by doing everything to heal us and to redeem us. The Good Samaritan, a people hated by the Jews, and likely by this lawyer, is the one who is expressing the compassion God expects from those who claim to know and love God. And this isn't a story about how nice we are. It's a story about how one of them helped one of us. Someone who was despised had compassion on us. The story implicitly reveals how far from grace, the grace of God, how far, far from the grace of God the Jewish religion had fallen. And it may have been reluctantly acknowledged, but the lawyer is correct uh, as to who, who was the man who was the neighbor of this man injured by the side of the road. It was the Samaritan who showed mercy and compassion. And that is the message of the Bible. Dear friends, if you are truly a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have a true saving faith, your faith will be revealed in, in the way you love people, in the way you show mercy and compassion, as James teaches us in chapter 2. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking daily food, one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And then he makes this interesting point. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So, dear friends, it's not enough just to believe in Jesus. But understand and realize that Jesus has saved us and given us the gift of faith to exercise it by showing mercy and love to our neighbor. And that's anyone who comes across our path and has a need which we can help. Uh, so who is the neighbor today that the Lord is bringing to mind? Uh, years ago, you know, I looked for stories about compassion and uh, being a good Samaritan. And years ago, it was 1992, I remember seeing the horrific riots in, Southern, in L.A., South Los Angeles, the race riots that were there on TV. They were horrific. Also watching that day was the pastor, Benny Newton. He learned that wildling thugs were assaulting a truck driver, Reginald Denny. They pulled him out of the truck. They, 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 they left him for dead. Well, they didn't leave him. They were trying to kill the man. And so this pastor of a church in that area, he rushed to the scene. He turned off his television, rushed to the scene. And when he arrived, Denny was gone. But the gang had already started on another man. Uh, they were pulling a man. It was a Guatemalan immigrant. They were pulling him out of his truck. Uh, the mob uh, 
was beating Fidel Lopez. They robbed him of his $2,000. They bashed his forehead in with a, a stereo speaker. Uh, they even tried to slice his ear off. Uh, and then they stripped him naked, and to add insult to injury, they began to cover him. He was naked. They covered the entirety of his body with spray paint. The man, Reverend Newton, he saw the depravity, and, and he fought his way to Mr. Lopez, and he threw himself on Mr. Lopez and said, kill him, and you'll have to kill me, too. And so these people shamed back into reality. They dispersed and all this is on video. You can find YouTube video of this event. The pastor prayed over this man uh, that he would be, recover and that he would breathe. The man was barely breathing. And when he tried to flag down an ambulance, the ambulance wouldn't stop. And so the pastor took Lopez to the hospital in his own vehicle. That was an example of a good Samaritan who laid his life on the line. The Lord may never call you to serve in such a manner, but even those little deeds of kindness uh, to a person in need will fulfill the law's demand to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Father, bless your people this day. Help us to take this lesson to heart. Help us to be thankful, Lord, as, as we call to mind people who have good, been good Samaritans to us, who have helped us in our need. And may we do likewise, go and do likewise, as the Samaritan served out of his own wealth, out of his own time. Uh, Father, he served with compassion, this man left by the road. May we, O oh Lord, have it revealed to us open doors for us to show forth the mercy and love of Jesus Christ. And these things we pray, Father, in the name of Christ. Amen. Your friends, you'll find on the homepage of the church, Fairfield Presbyterian Church, our closing hymn. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. And now receive this benediction. Receive it by faith with joy. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. And now the Gloria Patri. Thank you for joining the worship service of Fairfield Presbyterian Church. Go and do likewise.